learned that song a very long time ago, didn't we? And every time I sang it, I felt guilty because I knew I rushed away. You know, life was busy, kids were smaller. Um, and yeah, and I rushed away. So we're going to look at a passage where somebody didn't rush away at all. This is a passage terribly familiar to you. Um, if you want to look at it, it's Luke chapter 10 from verse 38 to the end. Very short passage. Luke 10, 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now it's interesting that in the New King James Version, which is the version I read in the mornings because it's in my bedroom, there's one little extra word here, and it says that when Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, her sister Mary also sat at his feet. Now also implies, doesn't it, that Martha sat at his feet. And of course she did, because we see later on that she's full of faith and she knows the scriptures. But here, and I've always felt rather sorry for Martha, and I'm sure that most of you have as well, because she's got a lot of extra people to feed. Probably even more than Jesus and his 12 disciples because someone pointed out the other day that very often other people were with him too. And although the meal probably was very simple, it's still a lot of food to prepare, to cook, to serve. And maybe she's sitting there listening to Jesus, but you know, she's getting distracted. We don't do that, do we? do sometimes if the sermon goes on a rather long time and I'm like, have I got the oven up high enough? <laughs> you know, and all that sort of thing. And she's distracted and she goes into the kitchen and she gets it all completed. And, and you know, she goes back into the room, Lord, don't you care? I'm doing all the work here. But Jesus, of course, rebukes her and says, look, what Mary has chosen to do is the best. Mary's sitting there just taking everything in, loving the teaching, the fellowship. Food doesn't matter to her. It really doesn't. She's feeding on the word of God. And the wonderful thing here is that what she has learned will never be taken away from her. That's a very beautiful thing, isn't it? Wonderful. Now, there are only three times in the New Testament that we hear about this little family. The next time is when their brother Lazarus, who of course we haven't heard about here, presumably because he was out of work, but he is very, very ill. And Martha and Mary send a message to Jesus, who is somewhere away, saying, the one you love is sick. So I think Jesus knew this family very well. They loved him, he loved them. And they are hoping, aren't they, that he will come because they know he can heal. But he doesn't come. And then Lazarus dies and he still doesn't come. And they bury Lazarus. Can you imagine the mixture of emotions here? The huge disappointment the confusion, maybe anger. Why, why hadn't Jesus come and healed their brother? And they're sitting grieving for their brother. The tradition in those days was that people would come and sit with the family and grieve with them. 
We're told that people came from Jerusalem. It was only two miles away from Bethany, where they lived, and they were sitting there just quietly supporting them. But Martha gets a message that Jesus is on his way. I can imagine. She goes out of the house and um, she's just in a turmoil, I assume. You know, she's, she's, what am I going to say to him? And we know what she said to him, don't we? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Very accusing. But she redeems herself and says, but... Even now, Lord, I know that God will do anything you ask him to do. That's faith. And listen to what Jesus says. Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Isn't this a beautiful passage? This is a little mini Bible study. <coughs> Sorry, don't touch me. Um, <laughs> he's got her out of the kitchen. She's not busy. He's got her to himself and he gives her this beautiful study. And these words that we're so familiar with, we're probably here at Beryl's funeral, I am the resurrection and the life. Wonderful. So Martha now, I think, I'm sure, is completely restored. It's as if Jesus has led her beside still waters and restored her soul. Psalm 23. So she goes back with peace in her heart, with joy, with hope, so different. And she goes into the room and says to Mary, the master's coming, come and meet him. And Mary, feeling I think exactly the same as Martha had felt, the first thing she says to Jesus is, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Why weren't you here? But Jesus gently asks her to take him to where Lazarus is buried. And you know the story, don't you? Absolutely wonderful. So the third and last time we hear about this little family is not that long after this. We know it's six days before the Passover, the, the last Passover feast that Jesus will celebrate with his disciples, and then of course, he is immediately arrested, tried, and crucified. But this happens just before that. He is back in Mary and Martha's house. It's a wonderful celebration meal. Lazarus has been returned to them. He is reclining at the table. You know, they reclined at a low table eating. Mary is with him, other friends may be. Jesus is the guest of honour. And Martha is serving, of course she is. This is her gift. She is good at it. I expect Mary prepared the food with her because you know, don't you, the Jewish people are famous for their wonderful food they do for every feast during the year and birthdays and things. Um, it would be, I think, a very special meal, beautifully prepared, and Martha serves it. This is how she worships God, I think. She comes and she has done her best. She's serving, she's worshipping in gratitude, in thanksgiving, in adoration, because her brother is back and sitting at the table. And then Mary does a very beautiful thing, this is a very different way of her giving her love and adoration and gratitude. She breaks open a jar of incredibly expensive perfume. We're told it was worth nearly a year's wages. That is expensive. If you equate it now with wages, of course, they, they vary hugely, but can you imagine 
opening a pot of perfume or even buying a pot of perfume that was worth thousands, I query spending £25. <laughs> <laughs> this was maybe a, a family heirloom waiting to be used for a very special purpose. And she breaks it and she pours it over Jesus' feet. This beautiful aroma. And she lets her hair down and she dries her feet with her hair. Now my um, King James Version says that because Jesus was the guest of honour, she would have anointed his head as well, because that was the custom. So presumably she anoints his head. And can you imagine that this perfume would have stayed with him? Maybe right up to the crucifixion. I think it did. And I don't think Mary washed her hair for ages. <laughs> of course, they didn't have shampoo, I don't know what they had, but it was just water. I think that wonderfully rich perfume would have stayed and reminded her of such a, a wonderful evening. And of course, we know that Judas Iscariot was there. He was the disciple who was in charge of the money bag, the, you know, the collection of money that they would have to use every day. Um, John, in his Gospel, tells us that actually he was a thief. He used to dip his hand into this money bag. So he's very conscious of money, and he is very indignant that this incredibly expensive perfume was used in this way. He said, look, you know, it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And Jesus says, you will always have the poor with you. But what Mary has done is a beautiful thing, and she's done it to prepare me for my burial. That's why I think probably he could still smell it in those terrible, terrible hours of, of trial and pain. So, my, I think the message that I felt the Lord was really giving me, and because we have just sung, to be in your presence is this precious time of being able to be in God's presence. What a privilege. Mm. You know the second verse we sang of Jesus is King talks about gone through the curtain, that huge curtain that was in the temple. We've gone through it and we're touching the throne. And the writer of Hebrews says, come boldly into the throne room of God. Because we're covered in his righteousness. We don't have righteousness of our own. We're covered in his. So we can come boldly. And it says to receive grace and mercy. Don't we all need grace and mercy every day? And we receive it. The Lord wants us close to him. You know, I think it's just amazing that he is intimately involved in our lives. He knows every day of our lives. He knows what we're going to go through. And he wants to speak to us, to encourage us, to draw us close, to make it very clear to us, I think, that he's with us all the time. I'm not going to go into details because some of you have heard this already, but I just want to say that I experienced this so very clearly not long ago. Um, I have my time with the Lord first thing in the morning because that for me works before the phone goes, before anything really, before the worries of the, the world <laughs> come in through the news or whatever. Just that peace and not only my Bible of course but one or two really good devotional books and one particular one called Jesus Calling. That's the first thing I read in the morning. It's just a little passage for that particular day. And I was facing a day that I did not want to face. I did not want to go through any of it. It could have been horrible. It was actually worse than I thought. And yet, when I read the beginning of this passage, the first six words were, Trust me, do not be afraid. Do you know that's all I needed? It's absolutely all I needed because that was the Word of God. How many times in the Word of God do we have trust? And don't be afraid. 
366 times, do not be afraid. And I felt totally at peace. Obviously, I read the rest of the bit and the relevant scriptures underneath and spent my time in prayer and reading. Um, but that stayed with me the whole of the day. I mean, it, it was amazing. But that's the power of the Word of God. And that's how much God loved me and wanted me to know that it was okay. Yeah. And, and I just want to tell you something else that's quite funny, really. Um, up until a few weeks ago, I had a beautiful ginger cat. And his great delight in the morning after his breakfast was to bound upstairs and sit on my lap, as I was to go back to bed with my first drink and, and then do all this in bed. And he would sit on my lap and he would purr non-stop. And I could be ages and ages, and he would purr and purr and purr. And one morning, I felt the Lord was saying, I haven't given you the ability to purr, but he is so enjoying your company. This is how I want you to be. I want you to enjoy my company. I thought that was very <coughs> precious. I thought, oh yes, how much do I really, really enjoy this? Am I just sort of talking to him and saying, please do this, please, you know? Um, just to soak in his presence and try to hear what he is saying. Um, yes, for you it might be a different time of the day, um, but there are very, very many places in the Bible where it talks about the morning. Um, and because we know that Jesus spent a lot of time, all night very often, but first thing in the morning, just praying and listening to his father and seeing what his, sort of seeing what his father wanted him to do that day. But I will just read you one. It's rather lovely. Psalm 143, verse 8. Let a morning bring my word, bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. And in the New King James, it's caused me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. Which is strange, isn't it? How do you hear God's loving kindness? But cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning and, and guide my footsteps and because I bring my soul to you. Yeah, very beautiful. So I just want to encourage you to be, yes, of course, to be a Martha when you have to be. But to be like Mary, sit at his feet and just soak in his, his presence, his love. And I'll finish by sharing this. I don't know where this little verse came from, but it was years ago. My husband wrote it out in beautiful writing and put a beautiful pattern around it. And we copied it and gave it to everyone at lunch club. It was a very long time ago. And it's beautiful. Every morning, lean thine arm a while upon the window sill of heaven and gaze upon thy God. Thus, with the vision in thy heart, turn strong to meet the day. Mm. Good, isn't that? We can face anything with him. And even if we haven't had time to spend with him that morning, he is with us all through the day. Wherever we are, Wonderful. Father, thank you. We do praise you indeed and thank you for your ever presence with us, your amazing love, your amazing care, your involvement in our lives, the way you just want us to be aware of your presence and your power and your strength and your guidance and your comfort and your wisdom and so much more. We give you our praise and our worship and our adoration in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to sing, uh, Lord, I come before your throne of grace with boldness. It doesn't say that.